thank you all for both coming in and coming out and accommodating our uh, logistics. Apologies for the tight space. We had a great, great turnout for this, which shows how key a topic it is, but we are now going to jump back in. Um, so it is a uh, great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Lance Hoffman, an old friend, uh, young in years and energy, if you know him, uh, but somebody who's been in the area of security and privacy uh, for uh, as long as uh, I've been paying attention. And uh, it's great to have uh, the CSPRI as a uh, co-convener uh, today. Uh, Lance will tell you just a bit about what he and his new center have been up to, uh, and um, we'll introduce our panelists. So Lance, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jules. I know that we are the uh, last uh, people, last panel between uh, you all and lunch. So while uh, I will mention that uh, the Cybersecurity Policy and Research Institute at GW does a lot of very interesting things in privacy and security related to this group, you have some material in your folder, so I won't take a lot of time on it now. Uh, perhaps later in the day, uh, I or my colleague Jessica Pulsifer, who will be here later, can say a few more words about it. But I want to get right to the group now, I think, because I, I know that uh, uh, we're catching up on some time. Um, this is a panel on data use for consumer services. Uh, our two panelists, uh, first is Jules Cohen. Jules, on my, uh, on, right in the middle there, uh, is the director of Trustworthy Computing Group at Microsoft. He works across the company to develop and implement online privacy and safety policies and solutions. Uh, more on him is in uh, uh, the booklet you have. Um, and I'll just make quick introductions for everybody so we can get to it. Uh, Ashish Venugopal is a research scientist at Google working on syntax augmented machine translation. Also, his material is in the book, but what's not in the book is something I got off his website, which I want to use to uh, sort of lead into this. Uh, he wrote about statistical machine translation, and you may say, what does this have to do with uh, de-identification and re-identification and that sort of thing? Uh, well, he'll let you know about that, uh, he promises me, but uh, I, I can't resist reading, he says on his website, statistical machine translation can be reduced to ordering food at your local Chinese restaurant. So since we're all starting to think about food, I see the rolls are already here for those of you who didn't get breakfast. <laughs> uh, uh, so what does this mean? Well, each item on the menu has a Chinese and an English translation, and within a few minutes you can probably <laughs> determine the Chinese translation, the Chinese characters for beef or lo mein, by cross-referencing several dishes with these ingredients. So it's reasonably easy to build a dictionary of Chinese characters and their corresponding translations, and possibly even for short phrases like uh, garlic sauce. Uh, now tomorrow you go to a Chinese restaurant and they put up a special dish on the chalkboard in Chinese characters. Now, I'm sure there are a few people in here who can uh, read these, but probably most cannot. And you can use your bilingual dictionary or your, uh, you know, your iPhone to uh, figure it out, maybe, as long as you've seen all the ingredients and styles before. If you extend this technique to the European Parliament proceedings for French and English and try translating speeches given by the French Prime Minister and putting together the phrase and the word to generate a translation, it gets a little bit harder. That's the part he works on. I'm going to turn it over to him in a moment to explain how this ties in with the topic of uh, uh, today's discussion and, and how big data is going to very much uh, impact consumer services and how we all interact in the marketplace in the future. Uh, how much identification uh, or de-identification is necessary to support the services. And the plan here is that we'll have each of our speakers uh, discuss how they see this question. Uh, I'll make some comments and ask some questions from a consumer point of view and they'll respond as they see fit. Uh, they may also, if they want, ruminate at that time on future technical and policy developments. I love the one that Alessandra gave earlier this morning uh, with the uh, eyeglasses, and you can just extend from that. The, if you have smart eyeglasses, talking to smart uh, uh, telephones, talking to smart clothing, uh, what happens next? And it's all connected to some internet, maybe not the internet, but some other net we have. Uh, anyway, after all that, we'll leave 20 minutes for Q&A, well, as much time as we can, uh, before uh, lunch. So with that, uh, let me turn it over to Ashish to begin. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you guys for inviting me here as well. Um, when I first got the contact to, to come and talk at this event, one of the first things I did was um, I wanted to learn a little bit more about privacy. And so I did a search on Google Trends to see what people are talking about with respect to privacy. So there's, there's two graphs here. 
Um, the one at the top is our search volume, so people who are looking for the word privacy on Google.com. And at the bottom, the, the second graph here, again over time, is our news reference volume. So journalists, people like you guys, talking about privacy. Um, and this is just the kind of stuff we like to do at Google. We like to, to look at trends, right? And this is a, a classic case of, of using data that's been accumulated across lots of sources, many different people searching, many different newspapers putting out reports. And you see some interesting trends here. And I'm not going to to stay on this topic uh, for too long, but I thought it was interesting that the search volume of privacy traffic is actually falling gradually, while the news volume is, is increasing. Um, obviously, we don't have enough data here to, to actually make any statement about why this is happening, but as a person who's really interested in data and as a person who's, who's new to the, the privacy community, I thought this was an, an interesting trend to look at. Um, and so what, what I'd like to talk about today is data-driven artificial intelligence. Um, and I put up here a very simple model of, of what we as data-oriented people think about uh, artificial intelligence. Um, what I have, uh, those blue boxes on the left, you can imagine some kind of data, which is an input data. You have your brain in the middle. You have some kind of output data on the other side or output data or, or understanding. Uh, and I've given a few examples that are going to kind of be, be the framework for, for what I'm talking about today. On the left, we see, je voudrais une, une baguette de pain. And that's a French statement that says something to the effect of, I would like a loaf of bread, right? And so you see this pairing here, uh, a French sentence on one side, a English translation on the other. And that's an example of, of this kind of data pair. Uh, another data pair would be an acoustic signal, right? Some kind of sound that you hear. And that in your brain gets mapped into, I'm getting really hungry, as we all are right now. And just to, to really dig it in a little further, a picture of a nice sumptuous soup. Uh, and our brain looks at that and says, yeah, that's soup. I know what that is, right? So in each of these three examples, we've taken some kind of data, which is this, the, the blue box on the left. Our brains map that into some kind of understanding. And what we are trying to do at Google and, and in the research community is trying to effectively do that mapping that we're able to do in our compact little brain with thousands of machines in data centers, right? Um, we're way less efficient at it, uh, but this is effectively what we're trying to do. We're trying to perform this mapping. And the case studies I'm going to use today to, to kind of frame this discussion are Google Translate and Google Voice Actions, which are kind of sitting at two different parts of, of this data spectrum. So in the first case, Google Translate provides instant translation for over 63 languages, and it's really built using very generic, publicly available data that's just on the web. And we're able to, to find meaning out of it in the same way as Lance described this, this Chinese uh, menu model uh, to provide a very valuable user service. And on the, on the other end of the spectrum, we have something like Google Voice Actions, which uh, allows you to just speak into your device um, and, and get search, get actions, and get transcription. But the, the kind of value that it provides is a lot more personal. Google Voice Actions needs to understand my voice. It needs to understand the things that I say. It needs to understand the people that call me to be able to provide a high value service, as opposed to Google Translate, which simply takes in any text and translates this for you. Right? It's not nearly as personal. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how, in both of these two scenarios, we have this notion of big data, but sitting at different points in the spectrum. So what is data-driven artificial intelligence when it comes to translation? So we're able to take these sentences in, in their in original language, the blue boxes, and convert them into sentences in the target language, right? And we're able to do this for 63 different languages. You can type something in on, on translate.google.com, and you'll see it in another language. And you can look at a web page. You see this Arabic web page from yesterday. Um, we, we, you see a news page. Most of us can't even read what's written there. And we hit one button, and we get a translation. Right? We're able to do this instantly. This mapping is, is happening at a speed that even a human couldn't even do this. Right? And we're able to do this because we're able to mine data that's publicly available on the web. There are billions of translated sentences on the web in multiple different languages. Right? And they're, they're put back out on the web. And what our machines do is to pair up these translations that are found across the web and try to understand something from those translations. So in this case, I, I've given you an example that uh, is from the European Parliament, where these two sentences were, were translated and put into the Parliament proceedings. And what our machines do is they try to learn 
the associations between these words, right? And all of this happens automatically. Nobody is telling our machines, well, program translates to program, and the translates to the. None of this is happening. This is all done automatically simply by seeing many, many examples of these translated sentences, right? And that's, that's the crux of how Google Translate works. It's not people entering rules, and it's certainly not people entering rules for 63 different languages, right? So in the past five years, we've gone from three languages to 63 different languages. And this has only been possible because of the data that's available on the web. And so the model that we've, we use in Google Translate is very much driven on this notion of totally generic publicly available data. We see lots and lots of these blue boxes, which is the input data, lots and lots of, of the red boxes, which is the output data, and we're able to build a model that just works great for millions of users, right? And the idea is that the quality that you get out of this is good for everybody, right? And it works on average for anything you type in. But does it work well for something specific that you, that you want to translate? Maybe it doesn't work as well, but on average it works really well. And so this switch of something that works on average to something that works for you is kind of the transition point when I talk about the, the second application, which is the voice search application. So for voice actions on Android, we, we allow you to say something, like tra transcribe a message to, to your friend and say, I'm running late, I'll be home around 9. And you just say that into your phone, transcribes that into text, and you hit send. You can say, listen to the, De to the Decemberists. It has to realize that's a band, if there's music on your phone, and it's going to start playing that on your phone. You can say, call Pizzeria Venti. Right? It's going to realize that, realize it's a place, and, and, and make that action, which is placing the phone call. And the same model is what's driving this process here, where we have sound clips on one side, that's the input data, and the transcription, and the, and Following that, the action is, is the output data. But this doesn't actually always work so well, right? So you, you have an example audio clip and say, recognize that thing, and it comes out as call two cents. Well, what I actually said was call Vincent. I didn't say call two cents. So what I need now is I need this to be personalized to the way I say things, right? And so the question is, how do we take this data-oriented model and adapt it to each user, right, to, to really add additional value. And so the first step we can stay, take in that, in that process is to go from saying not just, don't just build English models that take English audio and convert them to transcriptions, but so let's separate it for American English or Australian English or British English, right? And that gets us one step further. But the real value, the real uh, nuggets of useful information are actually in the content of the speech, right? When I'm talking, on my phone or when I'm making statements, uh, when I'm making uh, voice actions, I might be saying things that are very different given that I live out in California and I work at Google. I might be talking about navigation. I'd be talking about taking the 101. I'd be talking about translation in California, where somebody here might, ha might be t saying totally different things into their phone, right? They may be talking about policy. They may be taking 495, totally different roads, different places. There's different stuff that we each talk about, and for, and for us to really add value in voice actions, we need to be able to make sure that works for you and the things that you talk about. And so we have a, a different model of, of how personalized data gets used here. So we, we use the generic knowledge sources in the same way we use for Translate to build a foundation, right? So in this case, this foundation is simply being able to understand English in general, right? And the word two cents is equally likely as Vincent. But for each individual user, we also give them the option to say, this is what I talk about, this is what I want my phone to do, and here's the action I want to take. Right? And so when Bob says, I want personalized voice actions to work, Bob gets a little additional model built just for him. And when Vincent does that, Vincent gets an additional model just for him that gets tacked on to the, the generic model that builds the foundation of the speech recognition system. But Joe, who doesn't want to do that, doesn't need to. Joe's still going to have access to the generic model. And so the idea here is that the, the generic data, the, the, the data that is used to, to build that foundation, is augmented with the personal data. And that personal data adds personal value to make a really exciting, compelling service just for you. When we move, when we take the step towards personal data, we're also at Google, we're very careful about how we bring you to that process, right? So 
going through that process of turning on personalized voice search is a multi-step process where we're, we're very transparent about what we do. We, we ask you very explicitly, not in legalese, we say, would you like to turn on personalized recognition on this device? Right, so we tell you what we're going to do. You're going to have to opt in for that experience. And then, and this is something that, that's really exceptional about the way we, we view your data, we actually give you a full view and control of the data that we collected for you. Right? And at any point, if you say, I don't want this to be collected anymore, you can turn it off, it's deleted, it's gone. It's gone instantly. And so this same model of personalizing your data and providing a more, uh, more exceptional experience just for you can actually, we thought about taking this back to translate. Right? As a professional translator who often has the same things to translate, maybe there's technical terms of art that you're translating, we want to provide a platform to make it really easy for you to do that. And so we, we, have, we take the same personalized data model where we augment your data with, with the generic data uh, to actually help you translate better. And so in summary, what the, the way that we view this data-oriented artificial intelligence and its connection to privacy is we, we, we set it up so that there's a, a generic data that's building a foundation model. It's your private data that adds significant value for you. And we do this while providing transparency, security, and control for each of the users that's getting that exceptional benefit. Thank you. Please. Thanks, guys. Um, and thanks to the, the Future of Privacy Forum for um, giving us all the opportunity to participate today. Um, I was thinking about what Alessandro said about all the John Smiths in the world, and this is pretty much the only time I can be in a room with another person named Jules, so it's, it's pretty awesome <laughs> for me. Um, it's a true statement. Um, there's been a lot of interesting discussion this morning, particularly over here around, around, around governance and sort of the, the context in which this conversation sits. I thought I'd offer up um, a short example of the identification um, from the perspective of Microsoft in, in, in one particular substantive area, which is location data, sort of similar to the way Ashish was talking about the translation stuff, and then come back to the context in which we sort of think about the identification um, at Microsoft. Um, so let's talk about, about location for a minute. Um, a number of applications, websites, and features are, are you know, use, lo use location for, for, for consumer services. So this is things from pro providing driving directions um, or local search results. Um, this is social networking, but it's also things like anti-fraud detection um, and the like in, in financial products. And I, I think anybody who's used their phone and said, you know, where am I? I'd like to find such and such. Um, sort of appreciates the value of the data set and appreciates the, you know, the, what it brings to, to the phones. Um, and the value is, is somewhat undeniable, e even to the skeptics, and I, I know there are some. Um, but regar regarding the collection of location information, some may rightly ask, at what cost and at what risk? And does the value, you know, compare favorably to the risk? And how is the risk going to be managed? Um, what steps have been taken? Because I, I, think, I think it's pretty clear that, you know, with location data, as with some of these other, other data types we've discussed today, health data and the like, um, there's no denying that um, there's risk if the data isn't potentially um, managed and if, if the data is misused. So there's two major roles that Microsoft um, might play in the context of location services. Um, and the data we might gather is pretty different depending on which role we're, we're playing. Um, the, vo the role I'll focus on today in the context of the de-identification conversation is that of the platform provider. Um, in that role, we're, we're acting as a, a location positioning service provider. So that's the, the entity that you ask if you're an application, where's the phone? So, um, and in that role, Microsoft is essentially using map landmark information, which I'll, which I'll come back to in a minute, um, that, we've de that we've gathered to determine the location of a device um, uh, when, the, when the device, or, or an application more precisely on the device, when an application requests location. So we'll talk about de-identification in the context of the platform and how the platform creates a map of access points that it uses to provide appropriate location um, information to services and applications. In the other role, which I'll put out of scope because it'll, it'll vary by application, whether it's a Microsoft application or a third-party application, that's the role of, of, of actually playing the application service provider. Um, and that's, that's a role that Microsoft might play, perhaps, that are on our phones or anybody else who writes to our platform um, might play. And the policies around what people do with the data in those contexts is going to vary by privacy policy to privacy policy, depending on what app um, the, the users requested and, and installed. Um, so let's talk about the platform. 
that makes you know all of those all of those experiences possible. So, as noted, it's essentially a database that maps all uh, maps landmarks, and in this case, the landmarks are Wi-Fi access points and cell towers. Um, but it's not uh, a list of traces of where people have been, um, and I think it provides a good example of a, d a use of a de-identified data set in one of these com consumer services. Um, the most important thing to understand is that the database doesn't con contain any information about where a specific person or a device has been. It's been de-identified. Instead, it simply contains the identified locations of the cell towers um, and, and Wi-Fi beacons. So the, the, the database is constructed in two ways. Um, data is gathered using managed driving and using crowdsourcing. Um, both of those methods involve observing more or less the same kinds of data. So managed driving refers to sending out vehicles equipped with GPS phones and associating the coordinates um, with observed cell towers and Wi-Fi access points. Um, and that, that's a pretty important method when a platform is young and it needs a critical mass of data to, to begin being useful. Crowds crowdsourcing, on the other hand, um, refers to collecting the same kinds of data or similar type kinds of data, but from the actual devices used by individuals. As, mo as users move about and choose to use um, location services on their phones, Depending on the settings that they've chosen for their device, the device will identify cell towers and, and Wi-Fi access points and use the GPS capabilities on the device to identify the approximate coordinates of the beacons. Um, those, are the, those, are, those are the landmarks we're talking about. Where are the beacons? Um, periodically, the information is uploaded from the device and sent back to Microsoft. And then we have algorithms that on our end that look at the data that has been sent up by a given phone. It looks at the beacons that have been, been identified. Um, and it compares them to the same kinds of beacons that have been identified by other phones, and gradually you can hone in um, on where they are and build out a map. Um, so when Microsoft first designed and implemented the location services platform um, on Windows Phone 7, it actually did program the system to collect device identifiers and store them for a limited period of time. The team understood that using unique device identifiers was a sensitive decision and had um, a limited, obser limited observations of um, unique de device identifiers to three months. So there was a three-month retention policy. Um, the primary motivation was to provide a greater confidence factor of an observed point. So the idea is that for a, a single device observing the same landmark 10 times might be less valuable than 10 devices observing that landmark um, once. Um, it turned out that while collecting unique device identifiers can help assemble and refine a database of access points and beacons over time, um, the the, um, the identifiers have a diminishing value over time. So earlier this year, we discontinued the storage and the use of those device identifiers in the location positioning database. So the identifiers were removed from the, from the database, and we stopped storing new ones. And then further, as, as part of our most recent release cycle, um, which is called Mango, you might have read about it, um, we actually stopped sending um, device identifiers up to the platform, up to the positioning platform. And so phones that took that update or phones that are on the market now as Mango phones um, don't send device identifiers at all. So the, the interesting thing here is that the database remains useful absent um, these device identifiers. Now that it's fully, you know, in a more, more completely de-identified or fully de-identified, um, the, the, the utility remains. So um, I guess I wanted to segue a little bit to the conversation over here and just call out that this is an example where de-identification de was the appropriate risk mitigation tool for a particular data set. Um, and then if we could step away from the example just a little bit, and talk more generally about sort of de-identification in the, in the context of risk mitigation, um, I, think, I think it might be valuable. We, we view it as a risk mitigation tool. Um, and for any risk mitigation tool like this, I think it's important to think about it um, in the context of the particular harms and the particular context um, that you're in and you know, what, what policy you're actually trying to carry out. Um, so let's say hypothetically you have a policy which is um, the goal for some data set is only some people can look at it and the people that can look at it, they're not actually allowed to know who the data pertains to. Um, so in that case, you have sort of two levels of protection. Only some people can look, and those people that have access, you know, let's, let's um, limit what they can say, what they can read. Um, and so there's a suite, I think, of technical tools um, that you might actually consider deploying to solve for that, for that kind of case, and they'll, they'll, de they'll depend on your threat model, they'll depend on your context, they'll depend on the use cases. And they might actually span the analog world and the digital world. There's not, I don't think there's a bright line here between the two. So for example, redaction might be a perfectly useful tool depending on, on, on your use case and your context. Um, another might be physical security, you know, locking that file cabinet. Um, another might be rights management if we think about, you know, the, the, te the technical world. De-identification might, might play a part here as well. Encryption might, might play a part 
you know, there's this whole suite of things that you can do, use to do data governance that, um, that accrue to these kinds of ends. And which tools you're going to choose are going to be a function of the scenario, the harms, the use case, et cetera. Um, and you can imagine that for, the, for my hypothetical example, the right set of tools might actually putting a sticky note on the folder and saying only these three people are allowed to look in here and taking out your redaction tape and removing the names. And if it's not a particularly sensitive data type, but that's your data governance policy in your, in your corporation or your organization, that might satisfy your need in that particular instance. Um, in that case, you're, not, you're obviously not, re you're not eliminating risk, but you're, you're going pretty far down the road of reducing it. Um, it's risk mitigation. Um, I, I think it's worth thinking about the, the basket of tools in the context of, of good data stewardship um, and compliance because w one of the things I think is overlooked in here is that it's a basket of tools that can help people who are good actors or well-meaning entities avoid mistakes that they might make without those tools. You might have your set of compliance policies, but absent implementing some of these tool sets, you might have a much harder time achieving compliance. It might be much more difficult to actually um, do what you want to do. Um, so they're, they're really useful tools in the context of good actors who are trying to, you know, make sure they're doing the right sort of thing. Um, in the context of, 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 um, of de-identification and re-identification, I would, I would make the point that others have made um, that, you know, it's, it's, it's not an absolute, this is not a silver bullet. But it, I think that the, the, the issue here hinges on the economic piece, on the costs. Um, you may find yourself with a data set that you've, you've done a lot of work to de-identify, and that may be sufficient because somebody else looking at that data set isn't going to be able to derive the economic value from it that it would require for them to re-identify it, so it probably will remain de-identified. Um, and in all of these contexts, we have to, to think about the economics. Um, and I think that you, you have this spectrum of difficulty to re-identify in this case. Um, the, the other thing I would note is that, you know, I, this, is, this is a conversation about the good actor scenarios. And a lot of the, the discussion here I sort of interpret as thinking about the bad actor scenarios a little bit. And I, I guess I would note that clearly this is not a silver bullet in the bad actor scenarios, but we, we might not want to throw the baby out with the bathwater um, entirely. So certainly in the bad actor scenarios, the economics are going to drive so some of those things. And if you've got a scenario where you've made it sufficiently hard to de-identify, to re-identify, um, I think it's pretty similar to a scenario where all the houses on a block lock their door and one of them doesn't. The economics and the, and the risk and the time and the utility are going to make it such that the burglar is probably going to go after the house whose door is not locked, um, as opposed to the ones that have locked their doors. And de-identification, depending on the context, may take you there, and you may become the house with the locked door as opposed to the one, one without. That's going to differ you know, remarkably based on context and based on the threat model and the policy that you're trying to carry out. Um, so I guess I would just close by saying, you know, I, we think of, of de-identification as, as a good risk mitigation tool that sits among this suite of, of tool tools that help reduce risk. But it's certainly not a silver bullet, and um, it certainly doesn't stand alone in the bad actor scenarios, but it can help a lot in the good actor scenario. Thank you, Jules. At this point, I'm supposed to interject a few pithy comments and questions on uh, what a consumer might uh, say. I'll just mention a couple of things because I know uh, we are the last bastion between you folks and, and lunch, uh, and we know we're running, we started late and we're going to run a little late, I suspect. Um, first of all, uh, picking up the discussion at the end of the last session, uh, where in essence it's related to risk analysis, as Jules was uh, describing, what problem are we solving and, and what, what, are the, what is the whole collection of problems we want to solve? We don't want to be in the position of the drunk uh, looking for his keys under the lamppost because that's where the light is, even though he dropped his keys half a block down the street. Uh, and we, we have to be careful of, of what problem we're solving. Uh, on Ashish's uh, uh, comments about, uh, okay, if you come to us and say, uh, okay, I don't, I don't like it, get rid of my data, you'll get rid of my data, that is terrific. I think that's great, except you have to think about down the road in federated systems, uh, where uh, maybe Google hasn't done it in this case, but other actors could give the data, could be sharing it for perfectly good reasons, and then even though the data is destroyed at that point, other actors already have it. And what are they going to do with it? Is the data tagged somehow so you can get it back so you can say, hey, reel it back in or not? Uh, interesting uh, uh, policy and technical questions here. Um, 
especially when you start uh, running these things on uh, smartphones. So you have all these apps provided from different app providers, and some of them are more reliable and uh, uh, more reliable than others. I worry about one bad actor with data uh, sullying uh, all of the uh, uh, issues here. Uh, finally, um, Jules mentioned something about the economics. I hear this more and more and more. The economics incentives are just not the economic incentives are just not aligned right now. Alessandra has done a lot of work on this, and um, we are just starting in the computer security community to get a sense of well, what is security, and is it a public good? Uh, as Fred Schneider has said, for example, and Deirdre Mulligan, uh, what is going on here? We don't know. Uh, we're in an unusual situation. So let me ask if either of my colleagues here on the panel wants to uh, – oh, one more thing before I, I turn it over to them. Uh, I want to introduce you all. Uh, in the back of the room, uh, my colleague Jessica Pulsford just walked in. Jessica, if you can wave, uh, because uh, she'll be answering the questions I uh, uh, glissade over uh, at the beginning about CSPRI because I wanted to give as much time to this panel as we can. I will be back hopefully later. Uh, but I've got to uh, leave. I can't uh, join you for lunch, so Jessica will be warming my seat over there and, and uh, uh, can be talking to you if you want to ask more about Seaspray, and I hope to come back for the uh, event at the end of the day. Having said that, um, let me go to my colleagues here and see if either of you have any reactions, especially on the, you know, giving up the data and getting it back and all that. I mean, I think that's, that's exactly where it, it pays off to be very clear about what you're going to do with the consumer's data. And I think uh, being very simple and clear about where that data is going to be and not go is important. And that's what's going to build trust for a consumer. I think that the, the interesting thing here is that there are, there's this risk-reward balance in all of these conversations. And, you know, as we move forward and, and, and enter a world where, you know, everything is a sensor in some sense, you know, your, your car is a computer, your phone is a computer, your scales are a computer, your MP3 player, your iPod, all these devices are computers and, and, and they all begin to have this ability to exchange data. Um, you end up in, in a place where we're going to have to have, um, you know, interesting ways to think here carefully about what the risk reward return on is on, on the investment of sharing your data is as a consumer. I'll come up to the microphone. Um, so let me ask you guys a, a question because uh, clearly nobody has opted in to, these, uh, to this data sharing. Nobody has said, use my blog post to translate. Nobody has said, uh, use my Wi-Fi router to build this service. And so there are critics uh, in, in a lot of the data debate um, who are saying, well, yeah, that's good, uh, but people should choose if they want that to happen. Um, could these services exist on, a, let's assume, somehow some 2% of the uh, audience, 10%, 20%, I don't know, some percent of the audience uh, somehow thought it was an interesting idea when they turned on their phone. They said, well, I, I want to improve the state of location services, or I like the fact that this should exist. I don't know what percentage that would be, but it, it clearly wouldn't be 99.9% .9 or whatever is in there today. Do, do these things only exist because there's a default audience of a lot of data, um, are, are they achievable in some small way if some fraction of the data was, was there? Would it just take longer to build Google Translate and, and it wouldn't be as accurate? Could, could you sort of opine, because a lot of the debate uh, around this, you know, partly kicked off by some of the, uh, you know, surprise when people have sort of learned that the are, you know, these services exist and how it works, it has been, well, w I didn't know this was happening or, or I, I should have had a choice. And increasingly the, the question, isn't can it be identified, it's people should expressly choose. Um, so one of the reasons this was an interesting transition panel for us to sort of the marketing was, um, you know, is there debate at all here in the room or here on the panel or in the advocacy community that these sorts of things should only be on an opt-in basis? When, when Google started allowing uh, opt-out of the location services, I, I said, of course, this is a perfect example, but there were folks you know, in the Twitterverse who said, no, 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 opt-in. The answer is always opt-in. Um, do these not exist? Do these services not exist if uh, they have to be opt-in? Or is it, could, can we word the opt-in better? And, and is it just a matter of making it enticing enough so people appreciate the value? Well, welcome your thoughts. 
It's, why don't you go ahead first? <laughs> <laughs> well, th well, thank you very much. Because <laughs> the answer to this solves all privacy for the rest of the day. Right. Well, and then we can have lunch. Um, it's it's a good question, Jules. Because so I'm not I don't I don't have the background of the of the of the math, so I can't tell you definitively like this could not be done or this mm. could be done with a smaller data set. Um, I think that that you know with respect to to observing the the Wi-Fi data points, you have um, th th this interesting experience where you try to balance the utility um, and minimize the privacy risk. So in the case of the the data elements that are being collected. Um, when you drive around from looking at Wi-Fi access points. We're talking about MAC addresses. We're talking about signal strength. We're talking about is it a G router or an N router. Um, we're not talking about any of the data that's actually crossing those things. We're not talking about the names of the networks. We don't know it's called Bob's family's Wi-Fi. You know, none of that, that, that stuff is collected. There is an opt-out from, from our stuff as well. So I, I think the, the, the debate we're all having here at this point is, you know, given the obvious utility of this kind of a service, is the trade-off appropriate? And you know, I think that's the conversation conversation for the room. Uh, let me uh, pick that up and also get ready to throw it out to the audience here on that or other questions, because the question is, can it be monetized, and if so, how? Uh, what's it What's it worth? That's uh, apropos my comment about the economics. We just don't know. We're just starting to investigate the, the investigate the economics of this stuff. We don't know. But I'd be interested in the crowd wisdom, uh, and there's a lot of wisdom in this room. Uh, and, and either comments or questions on that or other things. Uh, you, sir. The United States Supreme Court recently heard oral arguments regarding the ability of uh, federal government prosecutors to put uh, tracking devices underneath automobiles without a warrant. And there was a moment of hesitation on the part of the government when one of the justices said, does that mean you could put tracking devices sides of the automobiles of Supreme Court justices in the United States? The ultimate answer is yes. Now, what if these tracking devices and what if the internet uh, facilities and all the rest are out there? There's nothing that I know of to prevent a non-governmental prosecutor, some Google person, from finding the frequency of those tracking devices. Probably takes some time, but you could do it. Uh, are we over the point where there's any hope of stopping what you're discussing with the Supreme Court justices determined that they can be tracked in quite the internet matter. Let me, let me try to answer that. I know we've got a room full of, uh, well, let me take a, I think I know the answer. Let me get a show of hands. How many people in this room are attorneys? Put up your hand, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, at least, about half at least, okay? So you have a good context. I know that's why you asked it that way. But I think of it a different way. I'm a computer scientist. I just play an attorney on TV. Uh, and uh, uh, as a computer scientist, I look at the system and say, you know, what's in the hardware? Look at the supply chain. What's there to begin with? Uh, maybe, maybe everything is already wired and we just don't know it. Uh, you know, and what does that mean? Uh, so. I don't know, I just want to raise that out because there's more than one dimension. There's the legal and administrative dimension, also the technical dimension, and all, all these disciplines have to come together. There's no one discipline that can solve these problems. But and, and I think just to, to also get back to Jules's question about uh, the, the data that's, that's found on the Internet, I think the part of the, the problem in the example that you brought up and, and part of the solution on the web is, is again, making things very simple. Right, making it very clear what's happened, uh, making it very clear that when you provide an option to a user, that user knows what he's doing. Right, the web fundamentally is a publishing medium uh, with very clear controls in most cases about what you're be what you're publishing. Right, so if you don't want Google to even look at your web page, that's very easy to do on the web. Uh, and I think that's what that's what contrasts to your example when when you're talking about a sophisticated piece of hardware that that we don't know where it, where it even got made. Uh, the web, in contrast, is, seems to be a much simpler problem that can be solved with much simpler solutions. Joel, uh, Joel? I, I was just going to say that I think that there is this interesting transition. I mean, to, to Ashish's point, the web is a bit, of, is a bit better known mm -hmm. than this transition to what peop some people call the Internet of Things. And as every device becomes you know, web-connected in some sense, there's, there's, a, there's a different <coughs> conversation because it's harder to give notice. It's harder to do some of the things you can do um, on the web. So I, I think just to answer your question, 
the folks on this panel have sort of maybe conceded the Supreme Court's point, because what's interesting about the Supreme Court is they're, they're, they're talking about data that is public. It's in the public domain, but no one disagrees the cops could eyeball you. But because of the ubiquity, uh, suddenly public wasn't just public anymore. There, there was a desire to deal with at least the government. And here you've got folks who are saying, they're not saying, this is all public data. What are, you, what are you talking to me? It's public data. It's stuff that's being beamed into the street, in the case of your Wi-Fi router, uh, or it's stuff that you posted. But no one here is saying, so therefore it doesn't matter, right? They're saying, well, it's public, but no, we want to let you turn it off. Um, and so the question is, you know, in this much more, you know, robust. But, but, but this is sort of the easy answer to that very, very, very hard question. Does it, you know, does it warrant a subpoena? And I think it's the in-between questions where there's a lot of public data that we want out there but is something, you know, is, it, do we want to somehow deal with the fact that it's not a bright line, just like it's not personal, non-personal, maybe public and public used in some very different context in some way people might not like, does that need any greater protections? I think that's really the interesting thing to that Supreme Court case for the rest of us who, are, who maybe aren't worried solely about the government civil liberty implications, but are saying, well, what does it mean to have something public, but yet somehow you should do something to protect it? Is it secondary use? Is it, you know, what is the exact analysis that we need? So. Well, theoretically, Google could scan every court record in every public court facility in every city and town and county in the United States. It's just a matter of person power. You hire some people and they do it. Can we do that and have that put on the web once it's public in a court when the only limitation now is physical? So hire a thousand Googlers, send them all over the United States in a week and have all the courts on the web. Yeah, well, I think that's that's sort of Harlan's point. There is a lot of data that we want online, already is online. How do we deal with getting the good? That we, you know, I need to have your mortgage. Sorry, I know how much you paid for your house, but, but I need that out there. So how do we deal with this new challenging issue? So anyway, I don't want to. Uh, other questions? Uh, let's see, somebody who hasn't asked before. Uh, I don't know if you asked before or not, but ask again. Well, he did too, so I'm, <laughs> I know him. <laughs> anyway, all right, go ahead. Speaking of tracking, discussion has been about permission before consent um, opt in opt out topic of the day is the is the identification I'm curious whether search or uh, you know browser might have some thought not that you can see this but <laughs> might have some thoughts about search. about whether de identification has a has a, has a relevant dimension in the web in the web tracking and behavioral advertising I, I mean, I, my my expertise is certainly not in in the search side of things, uh, but I I'm quite confident that especially when it comes to things that are that sensitive, uh, that it's it's there are cautious steps taken, right? And uh, that we we there's definitely incremental progress as opposed to radical progress in those kinds of dimensions where where a user very clearly can understand what his concerns are and, and, and I think both of our companies would are taking the utmost caution in those regards. With respect to, I mean, it's interesting because there, we haven't really talked about the PII, non-PII debate in here, which is, it's sort of, it's sort of inextricable from, from de-identification. That's far from the mic. Um, certainly there's, there's a lot of behavioral pro profiling that goes on or behavioral targeting that goes on without um, traditional PII and you have this whole spectrum of is that de-identified, is that not de-identified, the, the room can debate that. The browser in particular, our browser in particular, has, you know, a number of ways to, um, to a number of privacy features in there to help people who want to make, you know, proactive privacy decisions make them. There's the tracking protection feature, there's a, there's a few things in there that, that impact this space. And we'll talk more about that in the panel after lunch.